Today we're going to discuss how we can age fossils. Okay? Um, we can't take a look at a fossil and date it directly. We have to actually date the rocks around the fossil. And that's what we do. We age the, the igneous rocks around the fossil to figure out the age of that fossil. Okay. Does that make sense? So there are two ways that you can date fossils or rocks. Um, relative age dated. So you look at the rock layer in which they were deposited. And the older rocks are at the bottom and the young rocks are on the top. So if you think about like your siblings, you know, um, maybe you have an older sibling and a younger sibling, so you're like in the middle, that's like relative. I'm the young. Right, so you don't go around and you, you know, I mean, yes, you know how old you are, but like if I didn't know how old you were, but I knew you had an older sibling and a younger sibling, I'm like, okay, I can pinpoint it. So. Well, if we're in your class and we're seventh grade. I know, but I'm just, okay. She you said know. that she didn't know us now. Yeah. Guess how old I am. Oh. I don't know, 12. 12. How old do you think I am? 13. What about me? Because you're you're a little bit more mature-ish. Oh, what about me? I, I would say you're 13, but something tells me you're young. You need to, you you need to see Madison's other side, if you haven't seen. She has like a million. She has a million? I yes. do. Yes. I really do. I, yeah, I'll tell you later. All right. So um, the thing about relative age data is that the rock formation has to be undisturbed. So that means like no lava cracks went through it. Uh, it hasn't been involved in any earthquakes because obviously that's gonna mess up your layers. Sometimes when plates move, they move like huge amounts. Sometimes they get raised up, sometimes they get lowered. So it has to be undisturbed from any of those forces. So then the older rocks are beneath, um, the younger rocks are on top, and this helps us kind of figure out the order of species and when they appeared on Earth based on those layers. So I got a diagram here. <laughs> what the? Are you recording? Help us! Naughty, naughty, naughty! Wait, what did he say? I knew Peach. she was, so I looked at Ellie and I was like, <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Alright, you got it? She doesn't want to scream a little bit. Help? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, where would you find the young rocks in this diagram? At the top. At the top. Okay, the young ones are on the top. The old ones are at the bottom. Okay, so. So if you take a look at this clue side, you can see all the different layers of, of deposition. And so the newest rocks are at the very top. The oldest are at the very bottom. You should just wait till it gets real quiet. <laughs> okay, with absolute age dating, you can actually pinpoint it and give it a number, okay? So relative, you know, you're just looking at layers, you know that the older rocks are at the bottom, the young ones are on top, but with absolute, you associate a number, you give it a number, a numerical dating. So it's way more precise than relative age dating. I'm sorry, it's holding like yeah, out. Right? No. Why? Because you're going to Graceville. No, we're going to Quincy. Yay. Ouch. What does that mean? Well, I'm just saying, you know, we went to Graceville and we got to play at the big gym. You guys can play in that other gym. It's like shorter. They said they were probably playing the eighth graders. Yep. So Julia and I come play teams. They only have one team. They have like three or four. How's that possible? There's a home game here. Julia can't play because she was watching that. No, she's not coming. I talked to her at. Um, I don't think any of the eighth graders are coming, are they? No. Um, they, she can't play because of AU basketball. Their season's over. AU basketball. She, uh, she got told she could come back and play sports this week, but she went. Her and Addison and Raquel all went to the AU basketball thing. And Raquel. Now they're unable because they weren't supposed to go. They they still Mr. B is going for their job. Why did you say job like that? I need to and emphasize she's, she, she's job. missing out on four games. Oh. She's out for two weeks. Wow. And she plays over a lot of them. Yeah, okay, anyways, let's go back to absolute age dating. Um, so it involves radioactive isotopes. 
Radioactive isotopes decay into more stable isotopes over time. Carbon actually has three isotopes. So if you notice on the periodic table, here's carbon, number six. There's carbon 12, there's carbon 13, and there's carbon 14. 13 and 14 are unstable, and they break down into carbon 12. So what scientists do is they look at the amount of those isotopes. Um, so if this is when it, this rock was formed, notice all the radioactive isotopes, but then over time, they break down into the more stable ones. So then they take a look at the ratio between blue and yellow, and they use some math, and they can figure out precisely, approximately, how old that rock is. So it's kind of cool um, when you dig into Earth's surface, when you look at rock layers, the deeper you go, the further back in time. It's like a time machine. Is that a dinosaur and then a dog and then a fish? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. She just took my dog. <laughs> All right. Take a look at this uh, photograph. Okay, this is from Browns Valley. Okay, because wow. if you guys didn't know Browns Valley man, he's like one of the oldest human skeletons that have been found. Like not the oldest, but pretty up there. Okay, but he's still like not obviously alive, but <laughs> he's his. Like skeleton, do people go look at it? Uh, it is studied. I'm not sure if it's on display. I don't think it's on display. Let's yeah, take a, a museum trip. Let's uh, field trip to his dead body. Um, he was of I Asian descent. Work. So that means that he crossed the no. land, land bridge into Alaska and worked his way here. Wait, I want to go to Alaska, but my brother and I want to go bear hunting, and I said no. Okay. So these were some of the artifacts that were found with Browns Valley Man. And take a look at this fossil, if you will, or this artifact, I should say artifact, it's not fossil. It looks like a crescent roll. Kind of looks like a what? A crescent roll, like on the silver. Crescent roll, okay. Uh, anyone else want to venture a guess as to what it looks like? It looks an acorn. Like... <laughs> what? An acorn, okay. <laughs> kind of a shoe. No? A little bit of a Going more for like a, a spear head. Oh. oh. Sharp object. Okay. What is it? This is called a Clovis point. Okay. It's rock that's been chipped into kind of a spearhead tool. Um, and they can and they can date that. Um, so Browns Valley Man is about ten to between ten and fifteen thousand years old. Did he venture into Brown Valley? Um, they think so. That is that why it's there though? They call him the Browns Valley Man because he was found in Browns Valley. Because you do, you don't know his name, you know. Probably know it's like oh, good, or something. I don't know. One. Okay. Or it's just Phil. Could be. Could be just Phil. Who knows? <laughs> Could be Bob. Phil, Bob. Bob. It's Bob. Browns Valley Man now. Yeah, Bob down for Browns Valley. <laughs> Dear my Carl. <laughs> hot Carl. Hey, hot Carl. Uh, yeah. Okay. He's so fossils over time. Um, to kind of look at Earth's history, you know, that's a lot of numbers. Earth is 4.5 billion years old. So they divide Earth's history into different time units. Uh, Earth's history has four eons, starting with the Hadean eon, the Archaean eon, the Protozoic eon, and the current eon that we're in, the Phanozoic. So eons are really, really large time scales. Um, if you take a look at the Phanozoic Eon, the one that we're in right now, it's actually subdivided into three eras, and those eras are subdivided into even more time units called periods, and periods can be subdivided into epochs, but that's just too much information. But the thing I want to emphasize is that eons and eras are not equal in length. Eons are larger than eras. Madison. Will we ever be alive for a different eon? No. What's eon? You well, you know what? It's not really a set time. I'll show you a slide on the next page. You can take a look at the three eons. There's only three of them? Well, the three before the one that we're in right now. There's only four of them? There's only start? four eons. When did they start? 4.5 billion years ago. Sure. Only like, you know, a billion That's years That's a lot of years time. ago. They're going to end up so forgetting. So what was the year? Someone was not going to teach it one time, and then they're going to forget. So how did the years go? Was it like negative zero? Oh, it's just they just before Christ. 
No, that's part of it. You have BC and you have AD and then you have millions of years ago and billions of years ago. Oh, What's AD? Or death? Or death? Yeah. And then um, so this is just the top part, the, the latest of the Phanozoic. This is the second era, the Mesozoic, and then the third is the uh, Cenozoic. But then it can be divided into epochs, and we are in the Holocene epoch right here. So Browns Valley Man 10,000 years ago was kind of between the, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. But that's just extra info. The Jurassic Park. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I was just about to move on, and then I saw Jurassic, and I'm like, hey, guys, what do you think? And if you take a look at the fossils, evidence of it. What's Jurassic Park at? Yeah. Oh, Is that why wait, it was called BC? Jurassic Park? BC is before Christ. Is that why oh. it was called Jurassic Park? Yeah. Oh. <sighs> yeah. What? Hmm. Who okay. came up with these names? So here's the eons, the Hadean, when Earth literally kind of looked like a ball of hell. I mean, it was just like molten magma, okay? Mm -hmm. Then we have the Archaean, where it kind of started to solidify. Um, Protozoic, notice we have our earliest life forms between mid-Archaean eukaryotic organisms appeared in the Protozoic. protozoic. And then um, here's our Phanozoic, the la latest eon that we're in. So, yeah. That's the longest one, right? Yeah. Or is it just set up like that? You know, I'm beginning to wonder if maybe eons are billions of years. Because, like, look, this is 3.5 billion, and Earth is 4.5, so, like, maybe they're roughly about a billion years. So, I don't know. But then you notice we have three eras inside the Phanozoic Eon, and the eras can be subdivided into periods. So, the Cambrian period, just so you know, um, that's kind of like when animals diversified out. Crustaceans, um, land or organisms, fish, I mean, they all had these really cool body plans. The Ordovician period is the age of insects um, that were really, really large. We're talking like meter. Could you imagine a mosquito like three Did feet? Did they just start at one? I would be dead. It would suck all my blood out. Um, I think the Cerulean period is like the age of the fish, or I don't know. But they all have certain names. Um, and then up here is where the dinosaurs occurred. But then the extinction of dinosaurs occurred in the mid Cretaceous period. So. That's weird. There was so much time before dinosaurs. Yeah. Why? How do we know about it? How do we know about all the time before? Fossils. Then we dated. Yeah. So when scientists first found um, fossils, okay, and they were putting together this geologic time scale, they didn't have absolute data. They didn't have the technology to measure isotopes. So they relied on relative data as well as index fossils. Mm -hmm. Fossils to mark boundaries um, between different time eras. Uh, so some great examples of um, index fossils, the um, trilobites, because we don't find trilobite fossils past a certain period of time. The amnonite, amn um, we don't find them after the Mesozoic. So they use certain fossils to kind of distinguish eras. So on the next slide, I'm going to have four different like rock samples with various fossils. And I'd, I'd like you to tell me which fossil do you think would be useful as an index fossil. Okay, okay wait, can you explain an index fossil? Sure. A fossil that is found in a certain layer, and it, and it only appears in that layer. Okay. Okay, so here's the four outcrops. Like this, let's say this is place number one, place number two, place number three, place number four. And they have these fossils scattered throughout. Which one of these fossils, A, B, C, or D, would be a great index fossil? A. Why do you say A? Because it's in all of them and it's in the same one. Yeah, it's in all of them and it's in the same layer. If you take a look at B, which kind of looks like a trilobite to me, you can, you can see it dabbles in this layer and this layer and this layer, so that would be a terrible index fossil. This fan-looking fossil mm -hmm. um, is found mostly in this layer, but then if you take a look at this place, you know, it's kind of found. Other layers. That light one is this one? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just a variation of it, the ink print. And then this springy looking one, I mean, it's only found, yeah, right there. So that'd be a terrible index fossil. All right, the final thing I'd like to discuss is extinctions. 
So an extinction is when a species dies out, but we can have mass extinctions where many, many, many species die out. Because if we can't feed off of a certain species, we have to feed off of them. So just in the Phanozoic eon, the one that we are in right now, there have been five mass extinctions. So if you take a look at this graph, um, these different colored bars are supposed to represent life on planet Earth. And you can see where it drops off here at the end of the Ordovician period, the Devonian period. So there's mass extinction event number one, number two. This one, huge drop off into the Permian. We have one here with the Jurassic. There's four. And then the end of the Crustaceous is five. What's that? This is the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Wait, what was that? Uh, no, that, uh, they believe an asteroid or a comet struck Earth off the coast of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, and then it spewed out a lot of debris into the air that blocked out sunlight for weeks slash months. So then plants died, and then the plant eating dinosaurs died, and then the carnivores ran out of food to eat. Um, so it's kind of like a chain reaction. Yeah. Um, this one right here, the end of the Permian, 90% of life on Earth was probably wiped out. They're not exactly sure. They think maybe um, Earth kind of like turned into a giant snowball, um, which would be a pretty good, I mean, yeah. Earth has been a giant snowball at least three times in, in history, so. How about a giant fireball? A giant what? Fireball. Well, that would be in the Hadean period, hence the word Hadean, Hades, the god of the underworld. Is a blue fireball then? <laughs> <laughs> No? <laughs> far. Just imagine sitting up up there on the moon in a spaceship looking down on Earth like we do now, but all of a sudden the Earth is a blue fireball. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a sight? You have to look down in the atmosphere and when something comes down, there's like a big fire. Okay. So what can bring about mass extinctions? Um, one of them is environmental changes. So the environment changes, the organism that was living in that environment before it changed, you know, they just don't adapt, so they can't find the resources to survive. Um, we are kind of seeing this with species right now, like the polar bears. They're struggling with the, the climate changes that are happening in the polar regions. The ice shelf doesn't last as long. Um, there's hardly any ice out there. So then they eat ring-sealed pups that make dens in ice. Well, if you have no ice, then you don't have seals. So you take away a food supply. So then the polar bears have to swim even further to find ice, so further away from the mainland, like towards the North Pole, to find ice. Um, but then they're so far away from land that when the ice melts, they gotta swim even further. So it's, it's a terrible situation for the polar bears. Why do they need ice? Because that's where the ring-sealed pups are at. So now you're seeing polar bears oh. move in more south but that's where you encounter humans. And so there's been a lot of uh, interaction going on there. And very good, so. In Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost city in North America, they actually have a football field up there. And during football games, they have people that will um, like patrol with, with guns just to make sure that polar bears don't, you know. Be um, hungry. Right. And, and um, you know, like they have like, they have warnings when a polar bear is in town so like when I was student teaching in Barrow, Alaska, um, well, like, yeah, I was a student teacher. I taught up in Barrow, Alaska. So we were, I was out walking with my friend and um, all of a sudden she's like, we need to get indoors right now. Cause like she got like a text from mom saying like, hey, there's, there's a polar bear in the area. She's like, we need to get inside right now. And so we just like walked into the nearest like building and just stayed there until like it was all clear. It was kind of weird. Oh, but I had no idea what was going on. She's like, we just need to go. And then she told me, and I was like, oh my gosh, really? You guys have to do that? Wow. So um, for the environmental changes, there's, you could have a sudden change, like a volcanic eruption um, that you know wipes out an island or a part of a continent, or maybe it's a super volcano. You can have a meteorite or a comet that strikes Earth, just wiping out life right away. You can also have gradual changes, tectonic plate movements. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but Minnesota is still high on the equator. It used to be tropical islands. Right? Wow. What yeah. did they do to us? <laughs> we got the raw yeah. energy. Um, every year the Atlantic Ocean gets larger. 
Every year, the Pacific Ocean gets smaller. Pretty soon, California, well, I would say pretty soon, but over time, California and you know, China slash Japan, they will collide. Okay. And then we'll have San Francisco and I believe Los Angeles, they'll be neighbors in like thousands of years from now because Ooh. the plates are moving like this. So if you have San Francisco and Los Angeles, yeah, it'll be Twin Cities. Isn't it every two years? <coughs> no, every single year the, the water rises or drops two inches? Yeah, something like that. I think it rises because we're having an increase in sea level changes because the ice caps are melting. Mountain formation, okay? At the top of Mount Everest, you would find fossils of seashells because at one time, Mount Everest was at the bottom of an ocean floor and the two pl plates met and they pushed up like this and every year Mount Everest gets a little bit taller. Yeah. I have one year they're like, and then a new one. Um, sea level changes. Um, you know, Tayton just mentioned that. So um, it displaces organisms. Organisms need to move out of that area, otherwise they're they're going to drown. So like, we have a lot of uh, cities and people that live, you know, along the coastline. In fact, there's this crazy high percentage of people that live along the coastline. You know, and, and pretty soon that's all going to be flooded. So my suggestion to you don't live on the coastline in the next like 20 years, okay? If you're just putting yourself into trouble, like just. The coastline. But then there'd be new coastlines. That's true. So but yeah, so, the middle of so the like, world. yeah, you know, maybe like right here, because then you might be the new beach. Why do you right? live somewhere in the ocean? Your neighbors might get left down there and like, oh, we're staying here. You guys get to have a beach in the front yard. All right, do do final slide, know? extinctions and evolutions. Okay. So um, extinctions, yes, they're sad. But without extinctions, new species can rise. So, you know, mammals, after dinosaurs were wiped out, it gave mammals a chance to evolve. If dinosaurs weren't wiped out, humans, we wouldn't be where we are at in our evolutionary like time scale. We know that the fossil record gives us clear evidence of extinctions of species over time and that there's evidence of new species. Um, and so we call this biological evolution, the change over time in populations of certain organisms. I don't know if you know this, but horses, they were like the size of a dog and they have five toes. Four? Only five? That's like they didn't have four legs, okay. they just have five they, No, they have four legs, five toes. Oh. Okay, on all of their limbs. And they lived in four, like jungle forests, you know. But then as their environment changed, went from jungle to open plain, um, their, their number of toes reduced. Now they only have one toe. Yep, that's the their baby. Okay. They got larger in size, longer legs, so they can run faster in the open plain to get away from predators. Their teeth have changed. Their molars are stronger and thicker to chew on grass. Okay. So that's just one great example of how. Is there actually a such thing as wild horses? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like only people own them. But no, but you, you have to get them broken. Well, wild dogs. Yeah. yeah. Wild like dogs, Ellie. Yeah, that's actually wild. thinker. That sounds like wolves. Wolf pack. Wolf. No, there's like wild dogs. They're just dogs that <laughs> are <laughs> not in the jungle. No, All right, no, now we're going to read out of the book slide. for a little bit here. No, I can't just like look at the next slide. See, like, like, Ellie, the horse. I've been on a wild horse carrier before. The horse keeps on buckling up. <laughs> are we reading the book now? I yes. No. You did? Pretty true. I thought it was a super <laughs> And some movies. It was when we were at Lake Beauty by the parents, actually. <laughs> I'm going to say well, that you got mad because the horse in front of it was like stopped and started. Are you talking about yesterday's? Are you talking about yesterday's or today's? Um, oh, that's due tomorrow. All right, we are going to be on page 192. All right, determining a fossil's age. Scientists cannot date most fossils directly. Instead, they date the rocks the fossils are embedded inside. Rocks erode and are recycled over time. However, scientists can determine ages for most of Earth's rocks. Yes. Sure. Relative age dating. How does your age compare to the ages of those around you? You might be younger than a brother, but older than a sister. This is your relative age. Similarly, a rock is either older or younger than the rocks nearby. In relative age dating, scientists determine the relative order in which rock layers are deposited. In an undisturbed rock formation, they know that the bottom layers are oldest and the top layers are the youngest as shown in figure two. 
Relative age data helps scientists determine the relative order in which species have appeared on Earth over time. So then you can take a look here. We have trilobites, but then trilobites uh, disappear, and now we have like more complex organisms like fish. Which trilobites? These horseshoe-looking thingies. Yeah, horseshoes can be big. They're huge. Like they can be like this big. Yeah, a horse's foot can be that big. Yeah. No, I didn't say that. Uh, a horseshoe can. Oh, you're talking about actual horseshoes. Oh, okay, never mind. I was yeah. talking about trilobite. <laughs> Absolute age dating is more precise than relative age dating. Scientists take advantage of radioactive decay, a natural clock-like process in rocks, to learn a rock's absolute age or its age in years. In radioactive decay, unstable isotopes in rocks change into stable isotopes over time. Scientists measure the ratio of unstable isotopes to stable isotopes to find the age of rocks. This ratio is best measured in igneous rocks. Igneous rocks form from volcanic magma. Magma is so hot that it is rare for parts of organisms in it to remain and form fossils. Most fossils form in sediments, which makes sedimentary rock. To measure the age of sedimentary rock layers, scientists calculate the ages of igneous rocks above and below them. In this way, they can estimate the ages of the fossils embedded within the sedimentary layers as shown in figure two. So you can see here that this is like, it looks like a rock, and then this looks like a rock, and these lighter colors are supposed to represent um, the sedimentary rock, so then they can give an estimate as how old these fossils are. They're called what? Absolute. Fossils over time. How old do you think Earth's oldest fossils are? You might be surprised to learn that evidence of microscopic unicellular organisms have been found in rocks 3.4 billion years old. The oldest fossils visible to the unaided eye are about 565 million years old. Um, just so you know, those two oldest rocks that they have found, the unicellular organisms, one is in South Africa and one is in Western Australia. Minnesota actually has like a 3.1 billion year old rock just outside of Granite Falls. Really? Yep. What does it look like? Um, it's not that exciting. You can walk on it. It's probably the length of these two classrooms. It's just this big out granite outcrop. You can like climb just like up a little hill and then you like stand on top of this huge granite. And then you can see there's drill holes in it because scientists have like taken samples out to analyze. But yeah, it's one of the oldest rocks in the world alongside us. When we were in Arizona, we went into like these canyon things that were like a bunch of different red and purple colors. After we got out, um, there was this giant rock that you could climb on. And if you climbed all the way to the top, you could write your name and ring a bell. Cool. Yeah. Did you punch the top? No, I did. And I had a scar. <laughs> Because <laughs> I fell down a couple times. <laughs> geologic time scale. It's hard to keep track of time that is millions and billions of years long. Scientists organize Earth's history into a timeline called the geologic time scale. The geologic time scale is a chart that divides Earth's history into different time units. The longest time units in the geologic time scale are eons. As shown in figure three, Earth's history is divided into four eons. Earth's most recent eon, the Phanozoic eon, is subdivided into three eras, also shown in figure three. So here they have the... Um, Hadean, Archaean Eon, and the Protozoic Eon, and then here's the last Eon that we're in right now, and then you can see the three eras. How many Eons were in the Geolalic or Golic? There's four. Hey! Here's that's a homework question. Oh, I thought you were doing. Are you doing your homework? No. Divide in time. You might have noticed in figure three that neither Eons nor eras are equal in length. When scientists began developing the geologic time scale in the 1800s, they did not have absolute date and methods. To mark time boundaries, they used fossils. Fossils provided an easy way to mark time. Scientists knew that different rock layers contained different types of fossils. Some of the fossils scientists used to mark the time boundaries as shown in figure three. Often a type of fossil found in one rock layer did not appear in layers above it. Even more surprising, entire collections of fossils in one layer were sometimes absent from layers above them. It seemed as if it whole communities of organisms had suddenly disappeared. Dun, 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 right? Extinctions. I'll read one more paragraph and then I'll just let you work on your assignment. Scientists now understand that sudden disappearances of fossils and rock layers are evidence of extinction events. Uh, extinction occurs when the last individual organisms of a species dies. A mass extinction occurs when many species become extinct mm -hmm. within a few million years or less. A fossil record contains evidence that five mass extinction events have occurred during the Phanozoic Eon, as shown in Figure 4. Extinctions also occur at other times on smaller scales. 
Evidence from the fossil records suggests extinctions have been common throughout Earth's history. And in my college biology class that I teach, they say that we might be in a six extinction, um, mass extinction event right now caused by humans. What? We are causing the destruction and death. Oh, of I thought you were talking COVID-19. about we're going extinct. I'm like, oh, really? No, 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 no. We are causing mass extinctions of other species. So. All right, your assignment is the 6.1 part 2, and I'd like to look at the first problem, if that's okay with you. Sure. Sure. What do you mean? What are you talking about? No, oh, just let me explain. Yeah, 2 and 3, that's why we're doing this. All right, so if you take a look at the layers of fossils here, it's labeled 1, and then it goes all the way up to 12. And question two says, look at layers one through five. All right, so one through five. What was that time period like based on the fossils found in that layer? So let's look at the fossils, periods one through, or layers one through five. What kind of fossils do you see? Ocean stuff. Ocean stuff. So what do you think Earth or that area looked like then with all those fossils? Lots of water. That's all you have to say. That time period was aquatic. There was an ocean. There was a lake. There was a river. I don't care. Something associated with water. Okay, well, can we write that for number two? Or one? That is number two. Then you take a look at question three. It says, now take a look at layers seven through 12. What was the time period like based on those? Wow. Trees and animals and forests. Yeah, trees, animals, forests, we see ferns, we're seeing leaves, we see footprints, maybe it was a little wet there, but then we're seeing, you know, big animals, so it's, yeah, okay, so it was drier, there was no water, it was land, I mean, I don't know, just something along those lines. Okay. <sighs> Hold on, I have a paper copy, here we go. Nope, that's the wrong one. I have to get my life together. Oh, 